Thank you for joining us today. This webinar will cover our Your Financial Path to Graduation tool, also known as GradPath. My name is Brian Stone. I'm a policy analyst in the section for students and young consumers. Our section creates tools and resources for those working to help students, young adults, and their families manage their money, build credit, save or pay for college, and repay student debt. Also joining me today is my colleague, Kate Mullen. Kate is also a policy analyst in the section for students and young consumers. Okay. And so today, uh, we'll meet the CFPB and the section for students and young consumers, discuss our new tool for students and families, and answer frequently asked questions about financial aid. But before I get started, I'll read our standard disclaimer. This presentation is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of the Bureau. It does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Any opinions or views stated by the presenter are the presenter's own and may not represent the Bureau's views. This presentation includes references to a third-party resource. The Bureau does not guarantee the accuracy of this third-party information, has not vetted this third party, and does not endorse source third party. Other entities and resources may also meet your needs. This document was used in support of a lot of discussion as such, does not necessarily express the entirety of that discussion nor the relative emphasis of topics therein. So about the CFPB. So the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is a 21st century agency that helps consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. Okay, and so within the Office of Consumer Education, uh, we seek to prevent harm. And so we, have, we serve the general public, but we also serve special populations, including service members, veterans, and their families, older Americans, their families, and caregivers, traditionally underserved and economically vulnerable consumers. Uh, we serve K-12 students and also students and young consumers. Um, and within our office, our goal is to educate and engage students to prevent student loan default. Okay. The CSTV also has um, other resources to meet your needs, including our consumer coronavirus response page. And so this page includes resources to help you make financial decisions during the pandemic on topics like mortgages, housing, student loans, avoiding scams, and more. And we also have our new podcast, which focuses on topics including uh, money management, student loans, uh, managing credit, and more. Um, you can access the podcast by Googling Financial Intuition Podcast or by visiting the website um, using the link. Okay. Additionally, we also have um, other resources to support students and families, including our mailing list, where you can sign up to receive notifications of new releases, free bulk printing, our Ask CFPB tool, uh, which allows you to enter a word or phrase similar to a Google One box and pull back related content and resources, our money topics and blogs. Um, many of our resources are also available um, in other languages. And now we'll take a look um, at the actual problem um, that we're uh, attempting to solve. And so uh, around paying for college and some of the solutions. And so in 2018, FINRA did a study and essentially they found that uh, many students are in distress. So 42% of students were late with at least one payment in the previous year. 48% uh, were concerned that they wouldn't be able to pay off their student loans. 47% uh, wished they had chosen a less expensive school and 57% didn't calculate their payment before borrowing. And we also see that some borrowers don't know what type of loans they may have, who holds those loans, or even if they have a loan or a grant. Um, so it's very important to make sure that a prospective student understands loans and how they work before taking out one. Okay. And so for many um, students and families, paying for college is one of the most complex financial situations they'll find themselves in. Uh, many different, there are many different expenses happening at different points throughout the year, and the goal is to connect those um, financial uh, funding sources with those expenses. And so the Grab Path tool is a tool to help um, students and families do that. Um, but before we get to the actual tool demo, we'll talk about um, maybe some other non-financial ways uh, family, families can help students, but also um, that it's important to remember that um, even if a family hasn't saved for college, that any 
money that they can possibly contribute that's not taken out in student loan debt can help a student um, not have to pay off um, substantial amounts of debt later. And so there's research that shows that for every dollar a student borrows, they'll end up paying back two or more. Um, and this is because of uh, loan fees, interest rates, capitalization, uh, repayment periods. Um, so even earning $500 during the school year can potentially help a student reduce their um, student loan debt. Okay, and some of those non-financial ways to help. So a family um, can provide uh, their information for the FAFSA, um, helping a student research grants and scholarships, um, asking an employer about uh, tuition assistance if that's available, um, helping a student make a budget and sharing some family cost-cutting strategies, and a, a parent can also or a family member can apply for a Parent PLUS loan, and if a student's denied, it can um, potentially help them have access to direct unsubsidized loans. And so when a student's in school, um, making sure that you continue to provide information for the FAFSA, allowing students to live at home if that's an option. We understand that's not always an option, but if it is, uh, taking advantage of that, which could save on uh, room and board potentially. Um, encouraging a student to build relationships, and so those relationships include uh, volunteering opp opportunities, working, uh, participating in clubs and activities, connecting with advisors, professors, and financial aid officials, uh, because there are often opportunities to um, potentially access funding that may not be widely publicized that you find out through those networks. Um, and then being honest about past mistakes and um, encouraging them to uh, take advantage of their resources and also remembering that there are no scholarships for retirement. And so you definitely want to focus on um, making sure that you're securing retirement before um, taking out loan debt for a student and potentially putting you know, retirement security in jeopardy. And then we transition now to uh, grad path and so and how does grad path actually help and so the student loan life cycle there are four different stages that we look at so there's the application phase and the students accept it they receive their offer and then they and then there's a the decision but um, after the offer that's when things tend to pick up and there's a six to maybe eight week window where a student has to make um, substantial decisions both uh, academic decisions but also financial decisions and so what the grad path tool seeks to do is to serve as a tool um, between that offer phase and decision phase and help a student answer questions like does my funding actually cover my costs um, will I be able to afford the loans that I need uh, and is the school actually worth it for me and so um, we will transition to the next phase we'll actually demo the tool and so I'll hand it off to my colleague uh, Kate so she can um, take it uh, more in depth and actually show the tool. Thank you, Brian. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen so we can see the tool. Okay, so if you go to that website, consumerfinance.gov slash gradpath, it will take you uh, to the CFPB's website where the tool lives. Um, so it's publicly available to anyone who has internet to the access to the internet. And this will be the landing page that you'll end up on. And I just want to note again, as Brian just pointed out, that this is for someone who already has their financial aid offer or offers and are trying to make those final decisions. decisions. Um, so that's where it's going to work in the tool. So the, just to overview what we're going to do here, the first section is going to be about bringing in all of the information that is in your financial aid offer and your situation. Um, and that will help us in the second section where we can go through figuring out um, how to cover your costs and then how to actually, uh, you know, whether those, the loans that you're considering are actually affordable in the long run and worth your investment. Okay, so we're going to start by giving the tools some information to work with. I went to the University of Florida, so I'm to search that by the the mascot there, Gators. Um, so you can search by the, the school's name, the mascot, the, the city where it is, the, the state where it is, lots of different ways to look up your school. And you just want to tell it uh, what you're planning to do. I got a bachelor's in agriculture, so I'm going to put in my own information here. Um, I had only AP credits. We hope you will finish in four years, although we know that um, over half of students take longer, but the, the quicker you can get through, uh, the, the more affordable your education will be. 
And just telling the tool this information so that we can give you the correct um, the correct data going forward. You'll then have uh, the option to either enter the costs that are listed in your financial aid offer, which your school should be able to provide. Even if they're not in the offer, you can certainly follow up with the admissions office and find out what those costs are. Um, or you can have the tool bring in some cost data from the Department of Education, which is what I'm going to do, um, but that data is a, a little bit out of date. Okay, so we're going to start with costs because that is what drives everything with financial aid. Um, and essentially, there is no way to get more financial aid than what the school costs. That is, that is the legal limit how much financial aid you can uh, access. We want to make sure that these costs actually reflect what it's going to cost you to go to school. So every school has a standard budget or multiple standard budgets for different situations, you know, whether you're full-time or part-time, undergrad, graduate student. Um, sometimes, you know, different colleges within a university will have different standard budgets because of lab fees or other expenses. But you want to stop and make sure that these costs are actually going to reflect how much it's going to cost you to go to school. Um, things like taking additional courses, um, specific courses with additional fees, where you actually live, um, all of these things can end up adjusting your expenses away from the standard budget. And the reason that that's important is because you can then follow up with the financial aid office and say, hey, look, I'm actually spending this amount of money. They typically have some standard paperwork for you to fill out, um, and that can potentially make you eligible for more financial aid. The catch, of course, being that we always want to remember that financial aid includes loans. Um, so potentially that additional financial aid, quote unquote, is just going to be the opportunity to borrow more money and have to repay it later on. Um, but still, if that's what makes it possible for you to go to school, then that, that is definitely worth uh, following up on. In addition to those direct costs like tuition um, and housing, if you're going to live on campus, uh, the meal plan, et cetera, you're also going to have some indirect costs those include uh, books and supplies, um, transportation, um, that is an eligible uh, cost for financial aid, although you cannot use student loans to buy a car, um, and then personal expenses. That's everything from clothes and toiletries, doing your laundry, going out to eat with your friends, all of that falls into that category. There are other costs that are eligible for financial aid as well. Uh, these include uh, health insurance, child care, if you need to buy a computer, um, if you have any disabilities that require supports, those expenses are eligible for financial aid, as well as going um, abroad to study um, overseas. And I just want to emphasize again, definitely follow up with financial aid if you have additional costs. However, just because you qualify for more aid does not guarantee that you will receive it, and that aid can include student loans. Okay, beyond all of these traditional five categories that the school will take into account when they're looking at financial aid, we also want to think about any other obligations that you may have financially in your life. So this could include uh, car payments, credit card payments, if you're going to be sending money home to your family, anything like that. Um, we want you to be planning for that as well because we want to make sure that you are set as far as money goes for the upcoming school year. Okay, and then over the next few screens, we're going to look at different funding sources. Uh, these could include grants and scholarships, which you typically don't have to repay. So I'm just going to throw some numbers in here, and you can see as I do that, that this cost up here is going to start coming down. So as we're going through the tool and entering in, hopefully, the financial aid that you've been offered, um, we're going to see that this running tally is going to hopefully keep incre uh, decreasing towards zero. Okay, and then you'll also notice on each screen there are these green boxes on ways to save money and yellow boxes on pitfalls to watch out for. So that's just additional information that came from students, teachers, parents, and counselors, as well as financial aid professionals um, who have reviewed the tool and shared with us, hey, I wish I had known this, or I always get 100 questions about this. Um, and I just want to, you know, you, you'll see throughout um, encouragement to contact the financial aid office for more information. <clears throat> and I wanted just a blanket, you know, blanket recommendation there um, to always reach out if you have questions. They're happy to answer your questions. Um, in no way, you know, are they going to, you know, change your financial aid because you're asking too many questions or anything like that. Okay, if you're offered work study, um, that can be a great opportunity to get involved on campus while making a little bit of money. Two caveats, that money will not be available to you at the beginning of the semester to pay for things like 
tuition, uh, which are typically due at the beginning of the, the term. Also, uh, just because it's offered you does not mean it's guaranteed. You still have to apply and obtain a job, um, and on some campuses that's easier than on others. Okay, and then uh, many students end up using uh, loans, particularly federal loans. Um, these are typically the loans that um, are going to serve students' needs best um, because they have a lot of protections that are not eligible to, um, to private student loan borrowers. Um, for instance, subsidized loans in particular are gonna be uh, the way to go for a lot of students if they're offered them because the government will cover your interests while you're in school. So you definitely want to, if you have to use loans, um, then you definitely want to use any subsidized loans that you're offered first. You will notice here at the bottom, so 5,500 is the um, maximum federal loan limit for, for freshmen. Um, and you'll notice here that even though you're borrowing 5,500, you are gonna have a little bit less than that available to you in funding. And that's because of these loan fees that are taken off the top. Um, so you'll have to pay back 5,500, but you only have access to 5,442. So that 58 bucks is gonna go right off the top to your loan fee. And then when you do eventually enter a repayment, you'll of course be paying not just the money that you initially borrowed, but also uh, the interest. Um, that interest rate will change every year. Um, so for this line of debt, that initial first year, that interest rate will always be 2.75%. But let's say you're gonna use loans in your sophomore year as well. Um, that interest rate might change uh, next year. And so then that second line of debt might have a different interest rate. We'll likely have a different interest rate, typically does change. You might be other, offered other loans as well. Um, some states have loan programs. The school itself might offer you a loan. And there are some nonprofits uh, that, that tend to offer very low or zero interest loans. Um, you certainly, you know, these can be good options for some students, but you want to scrutinize the terms here and make sure that uh, the interest rate that they're offering you is reasonable, uh, the loan fee is reasonable, and that the, the terms um, are make sense to you. That includes the repayment plan options as well. Okay, and then finally, you might have other sources. So say you have a thousand bucks saved up um, from working during your senior year, and maybe your family can offer you, you know, a hundred bucks a month while you're in school. And so that's gonna add up to a thousand bucks. If you have some, say, if you're fortunate to have some savings, if you have some off-campus work lined up or employer tuition assistance or anything else that, that um, might come up for you, you can enter that here. And so we can see we have about four grand left to cover. And that's what this next section is going to be about, is how do we get this down to zero? Um, so before we jump into you know, making those numbers uh, fall down to zero, we're going to offer you some information on using your student loan strategically. Um, this page will explain to you, first of all, that any money you borrow, you're going to be paying back more than that. Um, unless you are able to somehow pay it back before that, that interest starts accruing. Um, and so because of that interest, you're gonna be paying back more than you borrowed. Um, this will explain how that, that interest accrual works. It also goes through some of the options you have for reducing the cost of your loan over time. Um, of course, we want you to minimize your borrowing if possible. So that you know goes to things like controlling your costs. Brian mentioned, if you're able to live at home, um, at any point during college, uh, that's, that's really something worth considering, for instance, because that can then help you avoid borrowing. Um, you know, if you, can get, if you can get by with a used computer, if you can buy your textbooks used, whatever you can do to control the amount that you're spending, that's gonna be your, your uh, first line of defense against high student loan debt. You can also shop around for lower interest rates if you're looking at non-federal loans. Uh, we would certainly consider, uh, encourage you to pay down the interest um, that accrues while you're in school. You typically won't be required to make those payments, but if you can you know, stay on top of that interest while you're in school, that can help you avoid what's known as capitalization, which is basically compound interest or paying interest on your interest. Um, because when you enter repayment, any, all of that accrued interest is gonna get added to your principal and will then accrue interest going forward. Um, and then once you are in repayment, you know, it's gonna depend on what your strategy is, um, but if you are not you know, seeking loan forgiveness, if you're just trying to pay off your debt, then of course 
Um, the more you, you can pay, um, especially if you can make payments directly towards your principal, then that's going to get you out of debt faster. And the reason we're talking about getting out of debt faster is because the longer you're in debt, the more interest you end up paying, right? Interest is something that keeps accruing over time. Um, so if you are going to graduate with about 30 grand in debt, which is uh, typical for college undergrads in the United States, um, if you can pay that back in 10 years versus 25 years, you're going to save yourself over $10,000 in that time, just in interest costs. Okay, and now back to that $4,000 we need to pay down. Um, so that's, that's the money that we're missing here. And this page will allow you to, for instance, revisit. So say you find out, actually I can live in a slightly cheaper dorm, so that's gonna take a thousand bucks off. Okay, I applied for a scholarship at a community organization and that came through. Um, so that gives me another 1500 bucks. Um, whatever, you know, however it is that you're able to, to make that, that money come down. Um, and it gives you some ideas here on the, on the cheapest ways to do that. Of course, borrowing, um, you know, we wanna avoid borrowing if possible. Um, for instance, maybe, you know, the college offers a tuition payment plan and then that will give you time to to earn this money over the school year and, and stay on top of it that way. Um, but if, if you've exhausted all of your other options um, and you've used um, as much of that, that federal direct loans as you can, your other two options are parent plus loans and private student loans. Um, typically, both of these are gonna involve a parent, um, certainly for the parent plus loan, it, it, it would be debt that goes, belongs to the parent. The parent is legally responsible for that debt. Um, and private student loans might be in the student's name, but they might also uh, typically require a family member to co-sign. Um, and we just wanna say that co-signers are really co-borrowers. Um, if you are co-signing a loan, if your parent is co-signing a loan, they are equally responsible for that debt. Um, so if that, that loan goes into default um, because no one's making payments on it, it's going to affect the credit history of everyone on that loan. Um, if that loan goes into collections, they can collect from the co-signer as well as from the primary borrower. Uh, so, you know, they call it co-signing, but really it's co-borrowing. You are, you are taking on that debt as your own. So we have some information here about the differences um, between Parent PLUS loans and private student loans. The U.S. Department of Education Student Aid .gov, is also a great resource for information on all of these topics. Um, and then if you are gonna use a Parent PLUS loan, you can include that here. So I'm gonna type that in here. Um, and we of course keep the interest rates and loan fees um, maintained. You'll notice that the loan fee is quite a bit higher um, in this case. And um, uh, you can also, um, some families, you know, they're using a Parent PLUS loan to, to zero out the student's need, um, but that, uh, that loan belongs to the parents. Um, as I said, they are legally responsible for it. However, the student might plan to be repaying it. Um, and if that's the case, you can indicate that here, click that box, and we will include it in your total debt for the next section, which is just for financial planning purposes and not for you know, changing who is responsible for the loan. Parents are always responsible for those Parent PLUS loans, even if you are, as a student, intending to repay them. Okay, so now that we figured out how to cover all our costs, um, we are going to look at whether we can actually afford the debt that we're considering in the long run. Um, so our guideline here is we wanna keep that total debt at graduation below your first year salary coming out of school. Um, so total debt less than that first year salary. And so this page will help you kind of eyeball that, um, by, you know, we do some pretty broad assumptions here to come up with an estimated total debt at graduation. That does include interest that you're going to accrue um, while you're in school. And then uh, we wanna compare that to your estimated salary. So remember back on that first page, I said it was getting a bachelor's in agriculture. We're using the Department of Education's tool college scorecard and bringing in some salary information um, about that program. And so I can see that my total debt is, I'm looking at about 34,000, so a little over the average um, amount. And, but the salary that I'm, you know, looking for here is 43,000. Um, and so I can, you know, I haven't violated the guideline here. Um, this is potentially a reasonable amount of debt. We do wanna remind you that this is the median salary. 
And, you know, the median is the middle. So half are going to make more and half are going to make less. Um, and we would encourage you to really do your due diligence on the career path that you're looking for. Um, the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics wage data site has additional um, information on specific career paths and what those earnings can look like. They show you not just the median, but also different percentiles. You can get a sense of like what's on the high end and what's on the low end, um, because not everyone is going to is going to make more than the median. Okay, and then the next thing here is uh, interest. Um, this will show you how much interest you're looking at paying over your 10-year repayment period. And just a reminder that you know it's not just the 34 grand; it's it's that interest as well um, that are going to be your costs. And then whether you can afford this payment on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, so if this is the amount that we're going to borrow, we can estimate that your payment will be about 330 bucks a month. That equates to 22 work hours if you're taking home 15 bucks an hour after taxes. Just to get a sense, you know, proportionally, where is your paycheck going to be going? How much of it's going to be going to um, towards paying off this debt? We can also look at it in terms of a typical budget. So University of Florida is in the south, of course. Um, so we're bringing in uh, spending data from real, real people in the United States um, in different parts of the country at that salary level. So someone making $42,000 in the south uh, is typically spending $3,600 a month. Um, and with your estimated loan payment, that's putting you right over the edge here. Um, so this will allow you to then go through and play with your average monthly expenses and see if there's a way to make that loan payment work. Okay, and then finally, you know, we might be feeling fairly comfortable with that amount of debt, um, but we want to think about whether this school in particular is really worth it. So we have some statistics here to help you evaluate uh, the strength of the school. Um, and in terms of the financial payoff, right? There's lots of reasons to go to college, lots of things you can get out of your college experience, but we're going to focus here on the financial aspects. So the first thing we want to look at is the graduation rate. And of course, this is crucial because if you want to get the benefits of a college education in terms of higher salary, a better career, um, then you need to, to graduate in order to get those benefits. So we have here, um, Nationwide, this is pretty much near the top um, at 89%. Um, statewide, it is it looks like it might be the highest or one of the highest graduation rates. And then compared to other public schools, again, we're still at the at the pretty near the top here. So we can feel, you know, I feel pretty comfortable with that. The loan default rate is going to tell you how many students go, uh, student borrowers go into default within the first three years of repayment. So 2% of graduates from the school went into default within three years of repayment. That typically means that they've missed uh, nine monthly payments on their federal loans. And uh, so this is an indicator of how many students were in, you know, in distress or for some other reason not paying their student loans after they left school. And then the loan repayment rate is a slightly different statistic on the on the debt situation. Um, this is telling you how many students within that three year period of leaving school are actually making progress on their paying down their debt. So they're not just keeping up with their interests, they're actually chipping away. Um, they've made at least one dollar of progress on paying down the principal of their debt, which is, you know, what is accruing that interest as they go forward. Um, so, okay, we're in the green for nationwide. Um, statewide, uh, we're pretty much near the top, and we're also doing okay for public. So 69% of students um, is a reasonably high percentage of students making progress on their student loans. Okay, then you get a chance to look at all of your numbers one more time, starting with your costs, because of course they drive everything. Um, then you can look at your funding. We have it broken down into non-debt and debt funding, so you can get a sense of, of where your money is coming from. And then those affordability statistics that we just looked at. So what's going to be your total debt at graduation? Um, how much interest are you looking at paying? What's that monthly loan payment going to be? Um, and how well does it fit in that budget? And then finally, these performance statistics from the school. You know, what's that graduation rate, default rate, and repayment rate? So you can get a sense of whether students are actually finishing their degrees and then what kind of financial situation are they in um, as far as 
how they're managing their debt afterwards. Uh, you can use this page to compare between different schools. Um, you can also hit the print button so you can have a PDF of it, and then you can look at them side by side. Okay, and then depending on how you're feeling about the plan that goes along with this school and this financial aid offer, um, here are some next steps to consider. You know, lots of paperwork goes into enrolling in school and you wanna make sure all of your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. Uh, we certainly encourage you to make a budget so that um, you can make sure that you have the right amount of money when you need it. Um, and we'd also want you to be thinking ahead to the next FAFSA cycle. That's gonna be, if you're using federal aid, that's gonna be something you do every year. Um, and then certainly we want you building those relationships, like Brian said, with the financial aid office, um, as well as uh, with your academic advisor, um, maybe folks in your department um, who can help you stay on top of graduating on time and potentially even getting credits from a more affordable school. Um, I know, for instance, at the University of Florida, many public schools, they, they will accept some credits from, from community colleges, and that's a way to bring down, again, you wanna control your costs to avoid borrowing. So if you can take some required courses that are outside of your major at a community college for a fraction of the price, that is a great way to, to reduce your total cost. And then that's it. And so you may have noticed throughout there was the save and finish later option. Um, and basically the way this works, you'll also notice I never made any kind of account. I never entered an email address or anything like that. So as you're going throughout the tool and entering all these numbers, um, for instance, here's our um, $9,000 in housing costs. Here's our $4,000 Pell Grant that I typed in. Um, all of that's getting captured in the URL. And so you can, you know, copy paste this and save it, send it to yourself, your parents, uh, your high school counselor, a teacher who might be helping you. You know, if you have um, a, a college access nonprofit that you're working with like Upward Bound, um, anyone who might be helping you work through this, um, they can take a look um, at the exact same numbers and information that you're looking at and talk through it with you, um, which, which can be really helpful. Uh, if things change, you know, like if you, find out, hey, I got this scholarship, or um, I'm gonna be in a cheaper dorm, whatever the case may be, you can always come back, revise it as many times as you like, and keep track of where you are and where your total debt is and, and, and how that plan is evolving as you get more information. And then we hope that you'll also take the time uh, just for a few seconds to, to tell us whether the tool was helpful um, as far as understanding your offer and understanding the potential impact of your student loans. Okay, so that's that tool, GradPass. Again, the, the URL there is consumerfinance.gov slash GradPass. And now that I've shown that, I'm going to hop into some FAQs that we've gotten, some frequently asked questions. As we've been sharing uh, this tool, um, we wanted to address some of those. Okay, so the first thing is just understanding the financial aid offer. And I touched on this while I was going through the tool. Um, but essentially there's, you know, you saw in the tool, there's a bunch of different types of aid and they each have different, um, they end up with different terms, you know, different requirements of you. So for instance, grants and scholarships typically don't have to be repaid, but you may have other requirements such as, a, you know, you have to keep your grades at a certain level or you have to stay enrolled in a certain number of classes. Um, perhaps, you know, you're only eligible for a scholarship if you're pursuing a particular major. So if you change your major, you're gonna lose that scholarship. Um, and so that's, uh, one type of aid that's available to you. Loans, of course, must be repaid. Um, work study is gonna be earned like any other paycheck. So again, it's not gonna be available at the beginning of that first term to, to help pay for tuition. Um, and then there's gonna be some aid that's dependent on the student's financial need, which you typically, that's what FAFSA is all about, is determining your financial need and then if you're eligible for that, those additional, scholars, uh, additional types of financial aid excuse me, not just scholarships. Um, how is they determined? Again, starts with FAFSA and that school's cost of attendance. And so that's where it's super important to make sure that that cost of attendance reflects your actual costs. Uh, we definitely want you to compare your financial aid offers before you um, make a decision. We want you to be paying attention to the bottom line and not just the amount of aid that's offered. Um, you know, what you wanna be looking at is how much is actually becoming out of your pocket, your family's pocket, 
Um, just because you get a lot of aid, if that school was super expensive to begin with, then that additional aid is, you know, we want it in context. Okay, other things you should be thinking about are budgeting for graduation. Um, so we want you to be thinking, you know, that's why we give you the total debt at graduation, and are you actually going to be repaid that student debt? So again, we want that total debt at graduation to be less than that first year salary. Um, if you get a financial aid offer and you just can't figure out a way to close that gap, please reach out to the financial aid office, um, particularly if your financial situation has changed, um, if you have other qualifying expenses, um, and just to, to reach out and say, hey, we can't actually afford this. Is there anything else you can do? We'd love to come here. Um, you'd be surprised some schools can make it work. So some good questions to ask the financial aid office about that offer. Um, again, is there more aid available is a perfectly valid question. You want to find out if uh, each type of aid is renewable, meaning will you be able to count on it in subsequent years? Um, and you can also ask if there might be additional grant and scholarship opportunities down the road. Okay, grants and scholarships. Lots of questions about this. Um, you might hear it referred to as free money, and I think that's a somewhat fair description. We want to make sure, though, that you understand all the requirements. Um, and there might also be tax implications, so you want to look into that as well um, on, on certain amounts of, if you're looking at really high dollar scholarships, you want to be looking into the tax implications as well. To find scholarships, the Department of Labor does maintain a scholarship finder page. Um, there's also a page on the Department of Education's website, student.gov. And we've heard from a lot of families that they, re they have better success with local community-based scholarships rather than these big national ones. Um, one thing we'd want to emphasize is that um, you should never pay to apply for a scholarship. Um, that, that's a red flag that it may be a scam. And, and even if it's not a scam, there's just no need because there's so many scholarships that are free to apply for. There can be lots of ways to qualify for scholarships, including things like high grades, uh, athletic accomplishments, I think we're all familiar with that. Need can be uh, a qualification for scholarship, um, particular career paths, specific traits. Um, and just a reminder that you, may, you might meet the requirements on paper, but that does not guarantee that you're going to get the money because uh, there's typically more people applying for that money than there is enough to go around to everyone. Um, you may need to continue applying for scholarships during college. Um, costs might go up and aid might go down as you're in school. Um, so that's where staying on top of the financial aid office, um, building those relationships, making sure you understand what your opportunities are is really, are really important. And then good questions to ask the financial aid office. And you may want to ask if they practice aid displacement. Um, if you're looking at getting some scholarships from outside of the school, um, some schools will then subtract that from the institutional aid that they're offering. Um, and so you'd want to be aware of that before you really invest a lot of time in pursuing those scholarships. Um, they might also call it scholarship stacking. Um, and then make sure that you understand the requirements. Okay, work study. Um, we've been asked, what is the job? And there's no way to know that because when you're offered work study, all that is is a, that you're eligible to apply for work-study jobs. They are not going to line up that job for you. The amount that it pays per hour is going to depend on the job. Um, the work-study amount in your offer is going to be the maximum that you can earn. Um, but again, it's estimated and it is not guaranteed. If your student is having trouble finding a work-study job, um, you can certainly ask the financial aid office if there is help available. Um, they might have some kind of employment search service that you can use. Um, and you might be also able to use your work study to compete for student jobs that are not actually labeled work study. Um, work study is fundamentally a subsidy, so it makes it cheaper for that employer to hire you. Um, so there might be, you know, talk to the financial aid office, there might be other ways to use that work study benefit. And then if you have concerns about balancing work and school, we want to point out that there can be long-term benefits to work study. Um, you know, of course, it might reduce the amount that you need to borrow, but it can also expose the student to new types of work and then building relationships with prof professors and other professionals on campus, um, which might make them aware of you know, career, scholarship, and internship opportunities. Okay, loans. Um, what are the risks of student loans? They have to be repaid, even if the student doesn't graduate and doesn't get a good job. 
Um, so just because you're being offered the student loan, that is not a guarantee on behalf of the government or any other lender that the student is definitely going to graduate and definitely going to, you know, get, get into a high paying career afterwards. Um, we also want to point out that you cannot rely on bankruptcy as a backup plan um, because student it, student debt, whether they're going to forgive it in bankruptcy court, it varies by the judge. It, there's a very um, low track record on, on borrowers actually being able to get that relief. The other thing we want to point out is that it can be, you know, I think Brian mentioned the statistics that um, over half of students in that study had not um, calculated their monthly payment before they took out their loans. And that might sound weird if you're thinking, if your main borrowing experience has been with, um, say, a car loan or a house loan, a mortgage. Um, but with the way that student loans work, they are accruing bit by bit, right, year by year. And that interest rate is changing each year. And you know, there's just, it's, a, it's kind of a weird debt product because you're not taking on the whole thing at first, uh, up, up front. Um, so we want to make sure that you're keeping track of your total amount of borrowing and that you're, um, you know, calculating what that monthly loan payment is going to be. Again, Department of Education, studentaid.gov has some great uh, tools for figuring that out. Uh, we mentioned the different types of loans. There's federal and private. Banks, credit unions, states, schools, nonprofits, and other lenders can all, can all offer student loans. Um, undergraduates are eligible for both subsidized and unsubsidized debt. Subsidized are cheaper, but they are based on need. Um, and for private loans or Parent PLUS loans, we want you to really think about the terms and conditions that you're being offered. Um, if you're a co-signer, you are also borrowing that debt. Again, I'll just repeat myself. Um, and Parent PLUS loans, they do offer protections and repayment options, just like any other federal loan, that are typically not offered by private loans. However, you want to keep in mind that application process, they are not evaluating your ability to repay the loan. So you'd want to use uh, the loan simulator to, de to decide if you can afford to repay them. Okay, other options for closing the funding gaps. Um, so certainly we can, we want to think about closing, uh, reducing costs as much as possible. Um, you can get cheaper credits if you can reduce your living expenses. Um, anything along those options, you know, along those lines are going to help you avoid debt. Um, and close that funding gap if you have one. Some schools, as I mentioned, offer low or no cost payment plans, which might make it more affordable for the family. Um, if the student or another family member can work or increase the amount that they're working, um, some families do use non-education funding, um, but you want to think carefully before utilizing those. And you might have additional options, excuse me, you might have additional options in your specific state or city. Um, as, you know, I mentioned no interest loans from nonprofits. Um, so you can do something like search for college access nonprofit with the name of your state and city. Finally, I want to mention public benefits. Uh, there's kind of a persistent myth out there that if you are in college, you are automatically going to be um, ineligible for something like um, uh, food stamps or public housing, and that is not necessarily the case. Um, those programs are typically run by state, so their terms vary from state to state. Um, and before making assumptions that, you know, you're not eligible, you know, reach out. Um, every state maintains a website for that um, where you can reach out and, and see if it's possible that you could get those benefits if you need them. Okay, is it too late to start a 529, which is a college savings account, or another savings? Um, and we would say never. It's never too late. As Brian mentioned, every dollar that you can avoid borrowing um, saves you $2 in the long run when it comes down to repayment. Um, so. Saving is always going to help, even if it seems like a really small amount, it's, it's worth more than it seems. And if you can't afford to any of the schools that your kid applied to and was accepted to, it's typically not too late to apply to other schools. Um, there are schools that you know, continue accepting applications past the traditional deadline. And uh, you want to be strategic. You want to compare your student stats to the school's averages. Private schools can offer more aid. We think of them as being more expensive, but sometimes they end up being more affordable. Um, so I would encourage you to use College Scorecard, and if you're a military family, the GI Bill comparison tool to research those options. Um, and again, you can just always ask the financial aid office, how can we cut our costs? Are there other funding available? 
And then finally, when we were building this tool, we talked a lot to students and parents about the relationship part of paying for college. Um, and a lot of parents um, feel very strongly, um, you know, that they, they really want to help their students go to school and they're willing to do just about whatever it takes. And so we get some questions like, well, should I pay for my child's education? And that's a really personal decision. Um, we would encourage you to look at the big picture. Do you have other students that you're getting to put through college? Um, how does that fit with your own financial goals? You know, do you have a mortgage you're paying off? Do you have other debt you need to pay off? Um, what, how's your retirement savings doing? Um, again, to echo Brian, there are no scholarships for retirement. If you want to balance that emotional decision making, um, we encourage you to, to use data. And again, look at the big picture. You know, how much is that whole degree going to cost? How does that balance against the salary for the, the career that they're planning on? And is that school actually reputable in that field? Um, you can call employers or do research on LinkedIn to see, you know, are people coming out of the school and going into the career that your student is interested in? Some families will have agreements on who's going to repay college loans um, that don't necessarily match who's legally responsible. So again, I'm going back to the idea of Parent PLUS loans where the student says, well, I'll take responsibility for it. Uh, we would encourage you to think through the worst case scenario and put it in writing. What is going to happen? Um, think through what's going to happen, not just financially, but also to your relationship um, if the student is not able to pay on the, the, the parent loans that the parent is legally responsible for. Um, you know, this agreement is not necessarily going to um, matter to the lenders. You know, whoever signs their paperwork, that's who they are, they are going to pursue for payment. Um, but having it on writing can help with, you know, preserve the relationship and, and make it easier to figure out how to go forward uh, within the family. Okay, and then getting more help. Um, if you don't have access to a high school counselor, we would encourage you to stick to impartial resources like studentaid.gov. Um, most states also sponsor their own websites on going into college. Um, you can look at college access nonprofits. Again, you can literally Google that, that phrase um, and your city or your state and hopefully find some things that are helpful. Of course, you can reach out to the schools themselves that your student is interested in, um, but they are going to have their own motivations. They are, they are, you know, trying to get students enrolled and trying to get students paying tuition. So you want to keep that in mind and filter that, that their information through that. Um, and if you have a really complex financial situation, you might want to reach out to a certified accountant or a fiduciary financial advisor to give you advice. Um, there are tons of resources online, but again, we always want you to think carefully about the motives behind the people who are offering them. And if you don't have a plan um, on how to pay for school, but you do some, have some financial aid offers, we, of course, want you to look at GradPath as an option. Uh, Consumerfinance.gov slash GradPath. Okay, I think that's all of our uh, FAQs. Uh, please feel free to reach out um, to the, the student's office here at the Bureau at students at cfpb.gov. And uh, thank you for watching.